Hello class, uh, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number 12 for History 101. And last class, we just finished up ratification of the Constitution with the last state, Rhode Island. So what I want to talk to you first of all about today is this particular handout right here. I'm going to scan this and put a PDF of it on the Moodle class so you'll be able to print it out and look at it or just view it on your screen if you want to. Now, what this handout is about is a famous book written by historian economist Dr. Charles Baird that was published in 1913. And the title of this book, as you'll see on the handout, is an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States. This was a groundbreaking book when it was published in 1913, and it's routinely still debated by constitutional scholars to this day. And in 2013, there was the 100th anniversary uh, sort of nationwide debate that took place among constitutional scholars across the nation. Now, what he basically argues in this book is that the founding fathers, those 55 guys we talked about, wrote the Constitution to pad their own pocketbooks and that they benefited tremendously economically from the Constitution. And he bases this argument, and if you take a look at this handout, the, uh, in Table 2.1, that's in the center of the handout, Founding Fathers Known Membership and Elite Groups. The first group that he talks about is holders of public security interests. What a public security interest is, is it's a government bond. And specifically what he's talking about are those Revolutionary War bonds. Now you got two you got two lists, major minor holders. Now, you'll notice uh, in the major holders, there's some names that you'll recognize. Governor Randolph of Vermont, you'll see above him the Pinckney. So we'll be talking about the famous Pinckney family later on. Uh, and there's George Washington himself, who owned a lot of these government Rebel War bonds. Then in the minor uh, holders list, you'll notice that Alexander Hamilton was one of them that you would recognize. Now, what he's talking about here is part of the Constitution. Remember, there was a big problem going on, the bond crisis. We could only pay 25 cents on the dollar on these bonds. And it was, you know, ruined our public credit and so forth. So... What's going to happen here is the Constitution gives federal government the power to raise revenue to pay these bonds off. And as we'll find out, it's going to be one of the major projects of Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton to pay these bonds off and reestablish the public credit. Baird argues that these guys embedded that ability in the Constitution because these two long lists of men all own these bonds and they wanted their money back and they got it pretty shortly after the Constitution was ratified. So that's part of his argument. Let's think about it for a second, though. Of course, we had to pay these bonds off. If we didn't, our credit in Europe would have been ruined indefinitely. Millions and millions of dollars worth of these bonds were held by the French, our ally. And we couldn't not pay them and the loyal patriotic Americans who held them. We really had no choice. Now, the second list you'll see there is real estate and land speculators. Now, when the Northwest Territory, uh, after the Northwest Ordinance was being sold by the federal government because it was their only true source of revenue raising, a lot of people lined up to buy large tracts of land out in the old Northwest Territory. 
because it was being sold for pennies on the acre. Now, this land in the, you know, the few years since then, uh, basically had become worthless because no one was moving there. It was too dangerous. The British still hold forts out there and they were riling up Native Americans to attack any American settlers that tried to settle there. <clears throat> As we'll find out when we get into the Washington administration, this is going to be one of the major breakthroughs for the Jay Treaty that President Washington has John Jay negotiate with the British. And it's going to open up the old Northwest Territory to settlement and it's going to make this land become valuable. So instead of being worth pennies on the acre, it might be worth a dollar an acre. And if you bought it back in the 1780s, you're going to make a killing. Let's look at the list. Some familiar names, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, all land speculators. The next list we have here are lenders and investors, the bankers, or people who own parts of banks, including Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, the Pinckney Boys, and others. <clears throat> now, what's going to benefit them in the Constitution, remember, we had this currency crisis. We had 14 official forms of currency, which was a nightmare, especially for bankers. The U.S. Constitution is going to give the power to coin money exclusively to Congress, and we're going to end up transforming to one form of money pretty early on in the Washington administration. So this will make bankers very happy, streamline their industry, and increase profits. But did we really have a choice? Could we function with 14 forms of money? Today, we'd have 51 forms of money. What a nightmare. <clears throat> just like, could we not develop the old Northwest Territory and just hand it back to the British? I don't think so. <clears throat> the next chart there, or column, merchants, manufacturers, and shippers. Uh, these were people who owned fleets of ships and we're engaged in trade. Where they're going to benefit from is the fact that the United States stabilizes, trade with Europe will flourish, and our trading ships will be defended on the high seas by a United States Navy that is now possible because the federal government can fund it. But obviously, we had to have a trade network with the Europeans and protect our ships from, as we'll find out in the Jefferson administration, from piracy. Now, the final chart there that we have, planters and slaveholders. These are major slaveholders that were Constitutional Convention founding fathers. What, there's the Pinckney boys again, prominent Virginians, uh, William Randolph, governor of Virginia, good old George Washington. Baird's argument is slavery survived and was not abolished in the Constitution. And in fact, slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. How ridiculous is that? Now, uh, you know, this list obviously is damning. Let's just talk about George Washington for a minute. George Washington did indeed own slaves, and they worked on his plantation at Mount Vernon. But he's not your typical slaveholder. When George Washington died, in his will, he granted all of his slaves their freedom. Most slaveholders didn't do that. Washington, by the time of his death, was feeling guilty about the institution of slavery. Now, one big argument lodged against Dr. Beard in his uh, theory of the Founding Fathers cashing in on the Constitution 
There's one name that's conspicuously absent here. Sometimes students will pipe up and say Thomas Jefferson. Well, yes, he's absent because he's not a founding father. Thomas Jefferson didn't attend the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. At that point in history, he was our ambassador to France. He was over in France trying to explain to the French why we couldn't pay off the Revolutionary War bonds or those public security interests. The name that you will not find on any of these lists is James Madison, father of the Constitution. He didn't write that Constitution to pad his pocketbook. He was not a wealthy man. He wasn't a major holder of government bonds. He wasn't a real estate speculator. He didn't, wasn't involved in the banking industry. He didn't have a fleet of ships. He was a slaveholder. He and his wife, Dolly, owned two slaves. They were like uh, personal attendants. They traveled with James and Dolly, his wife. They took care of their every needs. They were servants. Obviously, they're owned, but they're not field slaves like we typically think of the institution. <clears throat> so, the absence of James Madison really shoots a hole in Baird's argument. But it's an interesting argument, and it's worthy of debate. So, where we want to pick up next is, we want to talk about uh, the election of 1788. The Constitution's been ratified. We hold an election. We elect all the members to the House of Representatives using that crazy three-fifths compromise scheme. Uh, and we elect... Uh, George Washington to be the first president of the United States. The Senate will all be appointed by the state legislatures. And that's going to remain the case all the way till 1916 when we amend the Constitution and change it to them being elected like they are today. Something we sort of take for granted because we've known no difference in our lifetimes excuse me, or our parents' lifetimes. So, once the election takes place and Washington's sworn in uh, and Congress is sworn in, the government's up and running. Now, you know, this is all experimental. There's never been a government like this in existence with three equal branches and a judiciary placed on an equal footing with an executive and a legislative branch. And really, they're sort of operating by the seat of their pants here, making things up as they go. So, for example, President Washington, uh, even down to how do we refer to him? What do we call him? His vice president that was elected uh, in 1788 is John Adams. Famous patriot from Massachusetts, founding father, son of liberty. John Adams spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck we should call the president. And he was constantly coming to President Washington with these ideas. Here's what we're going to have everybody call you. And one of his suggestions was, Your Highness. George Washington said, go ahead and shoot me right now. You're not calling me your highness. I don't want any resemblance to King George III in any shape or form. Are you nuts, John? Now, then he suggested, well, let's call you His Excellency. Washington liked that just about as much as he liked His Highness. Then he came up with a real mouthful. Adams suggested that we call the president every time we refer to him the president of the United States of America and protector of their liberties. Finally, the real common sense person, George Washington, settled the whole thing and said, you'll refer to me as Mr. 
president. I'm a civilian. I'm a citizen like every other American. Just call me Mr. President. That's what how you still refer to the president if you were to meet him today, no matter who the president is, the proper way to address him is Mr. President, established by George Washington, much to the chagrin of John Adams. Now, let's talk about what the very first Congress does uh, when they convene in 1789, because boy, do they have their work cut out for them. The country's teetering on collapse, we're broke, and we need to completely reform everything, and now we have the power to do it. So the very first thing that they'll do is they'll pass our first system of taxation. And the first system of taxation uh, will be a 5% tariff. There's not going to be any such thing as income tax, and there won't be income taxes until the 20th century. This government's going to operate on the collection of tariffs from foreign countries. Uh, and obviously in the Constitution, we did away the, with the practice of states collecting tariffs from each other. And also the whole practice of states collecting any tariffs. All tariffs are collected by the federal government, and that's going to be our main method of revenue raising. And originally, we'll have a 5% tariff on every single import that enters the United States from a foreign country. So that's the first thing to get out of the way because they have to have some money to operate with. The second thing uh, that they're going to do is they're going to fulfill that gentleman's agreement made by Alexander Hamilton to Governor George Clinton. They're going to pass the Bill of Rights to the United States Constitution. Now, to pass an amendment to the Constitution, it requires a two-thirds majority in both houses. They're going to pass 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And those first 10 amendments, which will ultimately be ratified by all the states, which is part of the process, by 1791, are collectively known as the Bill of Rights. And that's where our most cherished rights exist in the Constitution in those very first 10 amendments passed by the very first Congress, fulfilling the promise of Alexander Hamilton to Governor Clinton. Now, third thing that this very busy Congress is going to do is they're going to create the very first cabinet. So we want to take a look in your book. We're now into chapter 9. And on page 185, you have table 9-1, the evolution of the cabinet. And you can see those very first cabinet positions created in 1789 by Congress. And the very first position created, as you can see in the chart, because they're in order of creation, is the position of the Secretary of State, our top diplomat. And when the position is created, President Washington has no problem thinking of and filling it with a very capable person. He's going to uh, appoint fellow Virginian Thomas Jefferson, who's gained his foreign policy experience being the ambassador to France, as we spoke about last lecture. So Thomas Jefferson will be the very first Secretary of State. The first Secretary of the Treasury, the second position created by Congress in 1789, Washington doesn't have any problem thinking of a qualified candidate for either. That will be his very close friend, former aide-to-camp throughout the Rev War, and a person who's almost like a son to him, Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton, as we'll find out, will be a very capable and successful Secretary of the Treasury. The third position created there uh, will be the Secretary of War. That's back in this day and age, 
We didn't call it the Defense Department or Secretary of Defense. It was the War Department. It will not transform into the Defense Department until after World War II when we reorganize it, build the Pentagon, and rename it the Defense Department. <clears throat> so, George Washington, once again, has no problem figuring out a capable individual. It'll be one of his most trusted generals during the Revolutionary War, General Henry Knox. General Knox, a very close friend of Washington's, will be the one that he trusted, <clears throat> excuse me, to take all those cannon that were captured at Fort Ty and Crown Point in 1775 and during the winter of 75-76, transport them by sled and oxen all the way from the Ticonderoga area to Boston to defend the heights of Boston the next year. Knox was a highly accomplished general in the Revolutionary War and our first Secretary of War, unconditionally trusted by George Washington. <clears throat> the final position that's created is the position of the Attorney General, head of the Justice Department. And the first Attorney General will also be a fellow Virginian. It'll be the governor of Virginia back then, Edmund Randolph, arguably the most powerful person in America under the Articles of Confederation because Virginia was the most powerful states and states held all the power. He will be named the first attorney general. So that rounds out the original cabinet in 1789. Now, the final thing, if that wasn't enough for this very first Congress to do, they have to uh, define the court system in America. The third article of the Constitution just says we will have a court system. The highest court in the land will be the United States Supreme Court, and it will be up to Congress to create lower courts. So Congress has to create a court system. They create a three-tiered system with the lowest courts being federal district courts. Each state will have its own district court. Then the middle level appeals court uh, is the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, they'll create 13 of those also. And then they'll determine the number of justices that will sit on the Supreme Court because the Constitution doesn't establish that number. And... Then George Washington will have to appoint all these Supreme Court justices and they'll be confirmed by the United States Senate according to the Constitution in Article 3. Uh, George Washington will appoint to be the first Chief Justice federal, uh, fellow Federalist and somebody we mentioned in passing last lecture John Jay of New York, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. John Jay is a very accomplished attorney. He'll be the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And uh, that's why, obviously, down in the city, there is the John Jay School of Law and Criminal Justice, which is a very prestigious institution named in his honor. So, let's review for a second all the things the very first Congress did. They created our very first tax system. They created the very first cabinet. They passed 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, and they organized the court system, all in one congressional session. Pretty amazing volume of work. But, when the pressure's on, Congress can actually get something accomplished. <clears throat> kind of like today, they're going to pass uh, Recovery Act after Recovery Act, which hopefully will guide us through this crisis, where the previous five years they hadn't done a damn thing. But when the pressure's on, the United States Congress can actually work. So that's it for this lecture. I'm going to take a short break and we'll pick up with 
uh, the Washington administration. So, talk to you in a few. Bye.